Today we're talking about email with an email marketing expert and breaking down the rules of effective subject lines, plus we'll be discussing send frequency, use of emojis, words that can give your opens a boost, and much more. Let's get started. Welcome to another episode of Ortho Thrive. I'm your host, Richie Gerzon. Our guest today is Jay Swedelson. Jay is president and CEO of World Data and the founder of subjectline.com, the number one free subject line rating tool worldwide. Jay can often be found sharing his email marketing expertise at conferences and conventions, but today he's here with us. Jay, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. So I'd love to just hear like a little summary of your career path. How'd you get to where you are now? Yeah, sure. So um, I grew up in the uh, direct marketing world. Uh, My folks at my kitchen table, we had no garage. They started a a direct mail business back in the early 70s. And um, back then there was no data. It was just a mess of a world. (laughs) And I grew up around that. And uh, right out of college, I went into that business. It was a smaller business and purely direct mail business. And that was back in the kind of mid 90s and pivoted that business more digitally. And I really fell in love with the idea of email along the way. Um, And then sometime about 10 or 12 years ago or so, um, decided to launch a site called subjectline.com just because a lot of our clients were getting more and more involved with best practices related to email. And subjectline.com took off and became a pretty widely used industry tool, a free tool that helps marketers really um, do email the right way. And so today, uh, my company, World Data, we are a uh, marketing agency. We focus a lot on the email space, helping uh, both business to business marketers and business to consumer marketers t- try to do email the right way and generate new leads, opportunities, sales, subscribers, whatever it may be. And we try to share best practices on whatever it is that we learn. And to give you an idea, in the last 12 months, we, we, we sent out six billion email messages. So we have a lot of data about what's working and, and what's not. Six billion. Yeah, you have quite a bit of data if you have six yeah. billion. <laughs> That's wow. awesome. That's a lot. All right. So today we're going to focus on email marketing for orthodontic practices. I guess we could start like what's the difference between email communication and verbal communication? What are the similarities and the differences? You know, email is a really interesting channel. Some people will say, you know, it's a legacy channel. Some people say, oh, it's dead. Nobody uses email. But at the end of the day, email is the only marketing channel. It's that one primary way that we communicate that never goes away, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, Social media platforms can come and go. Uh, The way that you interact with search can change. The way you interact with your phone can change. But email is that is the glue of everything that we do in terms of a communication tool. Uh, And it really is the backbone for how we register for things, how we sign up for things, how we get our bank statements, how we get our doctor's appointments. Email is that glue. So it's a foundational uh, component of the way that we communicate. Um, and, th- and that's something that's not going to change. Yeah, I agree. If you're getting your doctor's notices and bills through one channel, you're never going to leave that. And I know how many minutes and probably hours I spend on email every day. Absolutely. So do you think, how do you think the pandemic affected email? Did it change it one way or the other? You know, it was really interesting. Uh, we look at something called inbox activity. Inbox activity is the time spent in your inbox. That doesn't mean how many emails are opening. It's the time you spend in your actual inbox doing anything. Inbox activity, it surged during the pandemic. It has never been higher than during the pandemic. And the reason being is, first of all, we were all online more. I mean, look, we're Zooming right now. We're not in person, right? And people are now working from home, obviously, and they're constantly checking about, you know, do I have my school, do they have a mask mandate or what's going to happen here? Is this open, that open? Constantly online, constantly in our inboxes. So our inbox activity has never been higher and our checking for key communications within our inbox has never been higher. So in a lot of ways, I wish wish it was lower. I wish nobody was in their inbox And, and that doesn't help my business. But I wish it was the case because it would mean the world was normalized, right? Yeah. Uh, but because the world is just ever evolving, you know, actually it's been a surge for, for email performance. So really this is an opportunity to leverage email marketing unlike any other time. I mean, that makes sense. We are spending all that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And there are, you know, some pitfalls to avoid, some easy pitfalls to avoid, especially for folks that are, you know, operating medical practices for sure. Yeah, that makes sense. 
would you say because of this, we should increase the frequency of our emails, decrease it, keep it the same as it always was? How should it change our activity? You know, frequency is an interesting thing. People say, oh, I'm sending too much or I'm not sending enough. And the reality of it is it's about relevance, right? It's not really ever about frequency. There are certain email newsletters that I get literally daily that I love that if they send yeah. it out twice a day, I'd be excited. I got it twice a day. There are other ones like <laughs> once a month that are ethically horrible that, you know, I wish I should just unsubscribe, but I forget, forget to unsubscribe. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's not about, you know, how much it's about what are you sending? Um, and if you're wallpaper, then that's terrible. You're, you know, it, it, it's just about thinking about what you're sending. That makes sense. I get Grant Cardone's emails every single day, but that's how he rolls. I mean, right. so it's, you never know if it's good or bad. You just got to check it out. That is true. Um, we sometimes put downloadable lead magnets on a doctor's page. What do you think about that practice? Is it good, bad? How is it best leveraged for health practice? You know, in general, health practices don't necessarily realize the role that they play. What I mean by that is, when you are performing a medical service to somebody, you're not just performing that, that service, whether it's orthodontia or, or dermatology or whatever it may be. You are the thought leader on that topic for that person, for that family. You are mm. it, right? Your office is, is where they are looking for the knowledge base on that topic. And sometimes, you know, in the medical profession, you know, we lose sight of that. Office managers may lose sight of that and forget that. And the reason I say that is the content that you put out that you are quasi endorsing every time you put on your website or you send out an email is, is stuff that people are relying on. Like, oh my God, I need to understand that because I, I trust this voice subconsciously. They're saying, I trust this voice and I want to know more about what they're saying because they've already made the decision that you're the smart person, that they trust your thinking. Now it's up to you as a marketer to say, okay, we're going to put out more. We're going to really go deeper that we are that thought leader. So the more valuable content that you could put out that's not just selling that's actual thought leadership information within your category, the more you're going to deepen that relationship and really expand out on the, on, on the relationship you have with that customer, that patient. So if you're really pushing into wanting to be the thought leader in your community, because often this is a local business, yep. obviously, a orthodontic practice. Right. Um, we do a lot of blogs for clients, but we also have videos. Is one better than the other? Is there something else that, that we should be doing to really create that content to create the aura that they're a thought leader? So I would say there's two things that I think in general, um, it, it, people need to overcome. Number one is you don't need to make the Taj Mahal. Right. You don't need to take mm. create content that is, oh, we're going to make this video and we need to have it all edited and we need these cool graphics and we need all this stuff. It's going to take us three weeks. And it's, a, <laughs> you know, you're building a rocket ship where at yeah. the end of the day, you could come out and say uh, with a checklist, the seven things you need to think about for the first time, you know, your child gets braces. Right. And that checklist might take you 10 minutes to put together. Right. Whereas you're making this video that's going to take a month to produce where the same five people are going to look at it. All right. So the first thing is don't overthink it. Right. And you're better off getting out really good content that's digestible and getting out more of it. hundred uh, percent. And the other thing that medical officers make a big mistake about is they think they can't repeat content. Right. So if you go back and you look at any social content or any content that you've put out there that has done really well. Mm -hmm. Right. You can go back to the well over and over and over again, just spinning in a different way, saying the title a little bit differently because there's a reason it did really well. And when you put content out there, it's not like everybody's looking at it. It's only a portion of people. Go back to your best pieces of content, repurpose them and post them and read and keep doing that. It saves you a lot of time and it will generate a lot of interest. Ah, oh, that's a really good advice. When you say digestible, uh, what kind of reading time are you thinking? Is there a range that you're thinking about? The, the irony is, is that the, the, the simpler the content, the, the, the less of the content there is, the more that people want it, right? So yeah. if you're putting out there like a three minute video, it's like, oh my God, that, you know, you're hitting play, you see the three minute bar, you're like, forget it. <laughs> okay. I'm checking out, right? Yeah. Where you I see, you know, can. the four reasons you uh, should avoid putting wax on the back of your braces. I don't know. What, I don't even know what the topic is, right? And you could just, you know, see the four things. You're like, all right. I got that. I can move on. These guys are smart. I'm sticking with them. 
the faster, the simpler, even if it's like a stat or let's say it's a product that you think is good, a picture, we love this product, check it out. The faster, the better. Nobody has time for anything, period, mm. end of story. That's so true. So um, for orthodontists, often the major segments are leads in the database and patients. How should we be communicating with these two groups differently? Well, first of all, the biggest fail I think that medical offices make is when they get data, right? Someone comes to you, they fill out that sheet, right? That you guys input it into your system. And then there's some sort of really weird, strange period of time between when they go in that system and when they actually get a communication from your office. Mm -hmm. Okay, now two things. Here's the, here's the thing that most people don't realize. The first time your system emails that individual, the first time, that first communication, there's a lot of stuff that's happening there. It's not just, oh, you pressed a button and it went out. It's your system is interacting with that receiving email system. Let's say it's Gmail or, or Comcast or whatever. The yeah. first time those two systems are communicating from a technical perspective. And what's happening instantaneously when you hit send for that email to go to that person, there is a communication happening between those two systems. And if the person gets it and, and they get to their Gmail address, that first email, and they don't open it, that your Gmail system is learning, hey, you don't care about email from this new sender who just sent you something. You don't care, mm -hmm. right? So the next time they send you something, guess where it goes? It goes in the junk folder because you've taught Gmail that you don't care, right? Makes so sense. that yeah. first send that you do needs to have a hook to get it open. If you can get it open, it doesn't even matter if somebody clicks. If you can get that first email that you send to somebody opened, then the likelihood of staying in that person's inbox goes up by like 400%, right? So oh, even wow. if your subject line <clears throat> just said something like, hey, uh, your next appointment and dot, 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 or there's something special for you inside, dot, 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 anything to build any type of suspense or reason to open. It can't just say, thank you for your visit, or here's your confirmation. It needs to say something to get them to open, because if they get, the, if they open it, and for the life of that customer, that, that patient, you will stay in that inbox. So there's a lot to think about on that first send. Does it matter if it's an automated email or if it's just sent by someone in the team? It, it does not matter because it's coming from the same infrastructure. Uh, so yeah. you want to do whatever is humanly possible to get that email open. And then the other piece of it is timing. Um, if you wait more than 24 hours from the time you receive information, uh, to the time you press that first send, forget about it. Um, it's borderline worthless. And you're going to tie up your customer service because here's what's going to happen. You get the information. No follow-up email goes out. So what does the person do? They're like, oh, I'm not signed up. I don't have an appointment. I'm going to call. Mm -hmm. And then you're wasting time on the phone. Absolutely. So the faster that you can get that all set up and out the door, it buys you a lot of you know, calm time. Yeah. So that's an automation is key because it can just happen Absolutely. without any person... 100%. intervening. All right. So what if we're sending just a generic newsletter? This is what's going on. Um, this is what we're doing as a team. I know people love reading about the team and it's going to the patients and the leads. Do we, can we use the same subject line? Do we need to have two different subject lines? Does it really make any difference? You know, your subject line is obviously what's going to get this thing opened. Um, and if you have a static, you know, subject line for your newsletters, you know, uh, John Smith's ortho update, 2-5-2022, you know, the next week, you're just <laughs> yeah. changing the date. It's like, oh, my God, it feels like it's an email from an orthodontist. It's really boring, right? Yeah. Um, whereas if, if let's say, in that newsletter you're going to send out, you're going to be talking about something compelling, I hope, right? You highlight that in the subject line, like the topic that you're talking about in the subject line, and not just have the consistency of the wallpaper of the name of, 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 your, of your newsletter, you're going to increase interaction. You're going to increase open rates. So not leveraging that subject line is just giving up. And the people that send out emails that don't leverage the subject line with different types of really good tricks and doodads and whatnot are the people that are just checking a box that's saying, I sent out an email. They're not actually trying to use it as a marketing vehicle. Yeah, I, actually, I totally agree. When I saw you at Inbound, you had such good advice on subject lines that we changed some of our process about subject lines because there was some really good advice there. Did it work? 
Yeah, absolutely. Oh, good. So <laughs> be course, awkward if you we wouldn't down. keep using it if it doesn't work. <laughs> All right. So um, speaking about open rates, do we care more about open rates or click through rates? Are open rates, is that data even still good anymore? Because I've been reading a lot about that the last few months. Yeah. So uh, I wouldn't believe everything you read. Open rate is, they're both obviously very, very important. Open rate yeah. is super important. Click through rates is very, very important. What I would tell you is that um, open rate is a changing metrics. So you send out 10,000 emails, you get 2,000 people to open it, you have a 20% open rate. There's a lot of technical reasons why right now it may be going up or down or inflate or whatnot. But the bottom line is, is to know your own benchmark and then to try to beat it. It doesn't yes. matter about all the technical reasons it goes up and down. If you can say, okay, whenever we send out a newsletter, we get a 20% open rate. Whenever we send out an alert, for whatever reason, we get a 30% open rate. And then you say, okay, the next newsletter we send out, we're going to test sending out a different day. We're going to test using an emoji in the subject line. We're going to test you know, using a question mark. Whatever it is that you're testing, whatever variable, uh, and then you send it out. And on that newsletter, you get a 37% open rate. You're like, okay, good. I just beat my benchmark of 30%. So open rate is the metric that's going to let you know uh, if when you're testing certain things, time of day, day of week, subject line, things of that nature, um, if it's good or bad, what you're testing, it's hugely important. Now, of course, click through rate is everything because at the end of the day, you want them to click, go to your site and do things. There's no doubt about that. But at the end of the day, you're only going to get a fraction of people that click, like a small yeah, fraction. Like absolutely. if you send something out and you get you know, three or 4% click through rate, you're like, cool. That was cool. I got three or 4%. So they're, they're both mutually exclusive in their importance. Uh, but you got to focus on both. You mentioned dot, dot, dot a couple of times. You think that's a good practice for subject lines? Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, we're just people and we all react to the same things. Um, you know, when you see anything that has, you know, dot, 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 or if you got an email from, anybody and says, did you see dot, dot, dot? You're like, what? I got to see it. I got to open <laughs> yeah, it up. That makes sense. Right? Um, or let's say it's the medical office, our, our, the, our newest treatment, dot, dot, dot. You're like, oh, what is it? There's something I don't know about? I mean, uh, whatever you have to do to get that email open, generate that interest, that's what we got to do. So whether it's, you know, dot, 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 or you're using a question mark, or you're using some sort of brackets, whatever you could do to stand out a little bit. Every time you send out an email, it's a battle. It's a battle for uh, that mind space, right? And the thing I love about email, it doesn't matter if you're Apple computer or Nike or an orthodontist, or an orthodontist office in Idaho. Mm. In the inbox, everybody gets the same size. Absolutely. Same size from address, subject line, whatever. We're all equal. So we can play with the big boys and you can win if you're creative. Does the effectiveness of subject lines change very often or is it pretty much a psychological thing that's what it's working all the time? It actually not only changes where some things go out of fashion, there's also seasonality of certain things. Like, so for example, yeah. I mean, easy, low hanging fruit. Here it is, you know, uh, we're coming up. Valentine's Day is going to be soon. Your inbox can be flooded with, with emojis, with heart yeah. emojis, <laughs> okay. with everything you can imagine. And of course, of course it's going to get it open. Now try that again, you know, uh, March 15th. You'd be like, what is this? You'd be like, that's weird, you know? But then there are other things that are not just seasonal, things like personalization. We used to see in the subject line for medical offices, people saying, J, comma, check out our new whatever. But then with all the different privacy stuff, now everyone's like HIPAA, they don't even know what HIPAA is, but they mm -hmm. say, yo, you have my name in the subject line, you're using HIPAA violation. Like, it's really ridiculous stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's so personalization went out of fashion for for medical offices and hospitals and whatnot, because, of, you know, you're using my data yeah, in a I weird guess, way. Yeah. So things come in and go out and you got to always be kind of on top of it. Are there I see this in very many blogs about this. Are there certain days better than others? There's our concept you should be leaning on there. Should we be checking it every three months to see what the best day is what is the best practice there yeah no absolutely you know day is kind of a huge impact and so can time of day can have a huge impact and what yeah. i would say is um you know it, it's funny what happened with marketers uh marketers used to avoid mondays and fridays and they would yeah. do tuesday wednesday thursday primarily and that was the common theme for years and ironically what happened is because everyone did that um so there was so much email on tuesday wednesday or thursday that monday and fridays became better days 
right? Oh, because supply and everybody demand. Avoided, yeah. <laughs> right? So, so we created our own, our own world. And so what I would say really is to always be testing different days and different times of day. Um, and you'll find, you'll hit your groove, but then to retest it and constantly be changing it. Uh, because if you are always at the same time, same whatever, you do become wallpaper, unfortunately. I see. So for subject lines, for a doctor should be cute or it's just totally straightforward. What is the spectrum there? You know, I, I think that, you know, doctors have to wear, uh, medical officers have to wear multiple hats, right? If you're saying something serious, right? If there's a serious topic, we got to be serious. You know, uh, if we're updating our uh, mask policy for the office, you know, we, we can't have, you know, big smiley face emojis and, you know, all this nonsense. Whereas um, if it's some sort of, hey, you know, to did you know where you open it up and it's like the first braces were put on in uh, 1742. And this is a fun mm. fact to tell your kids, you know, it depends on the type of content, the type of thing that you're putting out there. Uh, certainly if, if it's a billing, if it's dollar related, you want that to be pretty, you know, dry. Um, yeah. But we, we in general, we like to be entertained. We like to see the shiny object. You know, we like to uh, uh, be happy. So utilizing uh, fun tactics, fun words, fun symbols, um, and you won't get filtered. That's the other myth. If you if you put an emoji or you an exclamation point or a, a question mark or you capitalize something or you say the word free, people think you're going to go into the into the junk folder, the spam folder. That is information from ten years ago. That's, oh, that's not good real. to know. For a lot of people, probably do believe that. Absolutely, they do believe that. And you know why they believe that? Because they go online and they Google it, and they still see articles today that say avoid spammy words, avoid these things. And I'll tell you where it comes from. 15 years ago, before technology changed, when uh, marketers would send out email, there was a lot of bad guys promoting, you know, uh, questionable Viagra pills and pornography and all this bad stuff. And all the receiving email networks Sorry, were, were it's my watch, all the receiving email networks were like, we need to get rid of all this stuff. And they didn't have the technology back then to just filter out, you know, uh, all these mm, bad senders. So yes, they filtered yes, out yes. based on content, the word free and the word mortgage and this, that, whatever. But now you fast forward, technology changed. And now they could see a bad sender because of the domain or the IP address that they're sending their email from and the platform that they're using. So they're no longer looking at the content, the words you're putting in your subject line to decide if you're a bad sender or not. So a lot of this, this stuff of falling in the junk folder is legacy information that for some reason is just stuck in the marketing community. Wow. So, I mean... Words do have some kind of effect. Are there any particular words that can help boost your open rate? Sure. I mean, the number one word has been and always will be the word free. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We all like free. And that's just an absolute fact. Any chart will show you free will do better than any word. 100% uh, fact on that. But then the other thing is anything related to urgency, not like it's urgent that you call us, but some sort of form of urgency where uh, this is going to run out. This offer expires two days left, don't miss out. Anything where there is a sense of urgency without actually saying it's urgent is the number one driver to getting emails open. The number two driver to getting an email open is any form of exclusivity in the subject line. This is just for our patients. Hmm. This is just for whoever, um, exclusively for. Uh, so exclusivity and urgency, any words or any phrases that can relate to those two things are really the best drivers. Oh, that's great advice. So when we heard you at HubSpot's inbound conference, one of the things we did change pretty immediately was taking a look at the friendly from and not making it always the same because we had kept it the same most of the time. Can you just talk about what that is and explain um, you know, that lesson that you had then? Yeah, sure. So when you send out an email, like my email address is the letter J Schwedelson at corpwd.com. It's super long, it's super boring, and it's bleh. Right. But when you get an email from me, it doesn't say that. It says my name, it says Jay Schwedelson, looks nice and normal. And that's what you do on your emails too, right? So when you send an email out, you can make the alias or the friendly from be whatever you want. It could be Ronald McDonald. It doesn't, you can literally make it say whatever you want. And that's not spoofing. That is the alias that you're setting on the actual sending address. Uh, people don't really spend enough time thinking about that alias, that friendly from, because they're just like, oh, we're uh, John Smith Orthodonture, so we'll just call ourselves John Smith Orthodonture. 
Um, and that's a waste of a really valuable piece of real estate that can really change your email performance. So for example, if you're sending out some sort of, uh, call it uh, a special offer of some kind, right? Or you're op- you have a, some sort of new product alert that you want to announce. It could be, uh, you know, John Smith, new product as your uh, friendly from, right? Yes. And then that relates to the subject line that you're using and that gets the open up. Anything you can do to make the person feel that this is not just like every other email, this is a special email. And that friendly from, there's not an email system in the world that you can't adjust the friendly from in about five seconds and it costs you zero dollars to do that. So uh, it's a great test to try out. Yeah, I think that's why we'd started using that technique immediately. It was free and it was very obvious that it should be used uh, strategically. Did it boost your opens? Yeah, it did. It made a little bit of a difference. Okay. Especially we had some really big ones, you know, you just hit it and people really liked you. Like, yeah, it was because uh, of the friendly from. <laughs> that's good. Um, so do emojis really work? Like, is that something we really should take seriously? A hundred percent. You know, um, emojis are part of our society. They really are. As much as that's ridiculous, they are. How we mean. We're, you know, a lot <laughs> of ways ridiculous. we're like, it is totally ridiculous. And we are, we are going backwards in time. It's like hieroglyphics. Yeah, I think now, of the yeah. meme, yeah, the meme that com- compares emojis and hieroglyphics. Like I can yeah. picture it. Uh, well, yeah, I have teenage kids and literally that's all how they communicate. I mean, I'll send them something, they're going to be going back. I'm like, they're basically telling me to screw off. Um, but that's how we communicate. And that's what we like to see. And it also we, it resonates with us. Uh, and so time and time again, we see emojis boost performance. And if you look at about two years ago, emoji use in subject line was at less than 1% of all emails. Now it's at about 6% of all emails have emojis in the subject line. You're like, oh, that's not a lot. It's actually a huge amount that it's wow. boosted. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a huge, huge amount. And the other big change factor was that in the last 18 months, we're now at about 94% of all emails received can view emojis properly business or consumer emails in their subject lines. Hmm. So that was a game changer. And that's why I don't think it, 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 it's going anywhere. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know it was that recent that yeah. these systems could recognize them. So how many is too many? Like, I remember you talking about book, like book, book ending end. emojis, putting on each end of the subject line when you, cause I yeah, know like in MailChimp, yeah. it starts giving you warnings, you know, right, 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 right. <laughs> you know, I would say like proceed with caution with anything, you know, you don't want to go out there. You want to sign up for some crazy emails, sign up for Wayfair's emails, sign up for Domino's pizza emails. You'll never see more emojis used in your life than those two, two senders. <laughs> okay. So there's somewhere between where you're probably at now, which is not using them and what they're doing. And if you want to live toward it in the middle, that's a good place to be like one emoji at a time, I would say. Okay, that's fair. All right. So when you're gauging email success, what analytics should we really focus on? Is it mainly open rate? Are there other ones we should really be? Well, there's also the data side of things. You know, you always want to be looking at, um, you always want to be looking at, okay, you have X number of records, right? You have 10,000 records, you press send, how many were actually delivered? How many bounced? How many did not get delivered? Is that number going up or down? Do you have a problem there? So you have those metrics, which are obviously key. You have your open rate. Uh, you have your your click through rate, right? And then you also have your abandon rate on your site. Those are kind of like the, the key metrics there um, at the at very baseline. And then the other thing you always want to be thinking about, are you growing your database? And what do you, what tactics do you have to grow your database, right? Because if you don't have, it can't just be patients are coming to your office and they fill out uh, that boring piece of paper that you hand them. That can't be mm. the only way that you are growing your database. Right. There's so many different opportunities to do data capture. Somebody comes to your site, you can have a little pop up that could be a checklist. I could say, hey, you know, the seven things you need to know before you pick an orthodontist. Right. Click here to download. Give us your email address. That's why they're going to your site. They're not going to your site to get the weather. Right. They're going to their site because their kids teeth are jacked up. Right. So give them the tools, give them the information. Right. Right there and build and grow your database, because if your database is shrinking, uh, and you don't have a plan to grow it, you have bad math going on. Absolutely. So what do you think some of the main reasons people might unsubscribe from your email? Sure. I mean, why do people unsubscribe from the medical office? Number one, they're angry. Didn't go well. Fine. Get them off your list. Please yeah, you want I'm, them a, I'm a big fan of when them doubt, take them out. Right. <laughs> There's no reason to keep somebody on your list that you're even 50-50 on whether or not they should be on your list. 
right? If they're going to cause you a headache, get them out of there because they can cause you a really big headache. Right. Um, And the other people reason I subscribe is, you know, they don't need your service anymore and people age out, especially in orthodontia, you know, they age out and that, that, that's fine too. Um, Very rarely with your, unless you are a medical office that is just being uber aggressive. Okay. With how much you're sending, what you're doing it's very rare to unsubscribe from any of your doctor's emails, right? You have to really be doing something particularly wrong. So if you see your unsubscribe rate going up, uh, on any you know significant basis, that's a time to step back and say, okay, something is off, something is bizarre, because we're in a one space where people actually stay on. It's not like your gap, and you don't want more gar- car. Yeah, absolutely. Shows. I'd agree with the data we've seen. It's very low unsubscribes. Yeah. Unless I wish I had really the unsubscribes wrong. that doctors offer. <laughs> um, how important is that pre-header or preview in the email? We had a super important real estate that nobody pays attention to. So when you get an email, you look at it on your phone, right? you got the from address. It's from uh, John Smith. Then you have the subject line. Hey, check this out. And then below you have that gray line uh, that usually says, unfortunately, it usually says, if you're having trouble viewing this, click here or view in a browser, right? A lot of marketers use that. That is called pre-header text to deal with what's called format issues, right? The, that you open it up and then you can click on. You can't see it. Click here. But that real estate is super valuable because number one, when it says that before you open up a message and says, click here, if you can't view it or view whatever, it's nonsense. You haven't opened up the message. You don't even know if you have a problem. It's the dumbest thing in the world to use it for that purpose, which is what 70% of marketers do. They use it to say, if you're having an issue, click here. What you should be doing is using it to tie it to your offer or whatever your newsletter is. Maybe it's the the first stat of your newsletter, or maybe it's to discuss more about your offer. It should be an extension of your subject line. You have about 85 characters to use in your pre-header. And if you use it for things like, you know, to view in a browser, click here, you are failing. Uh, That is an epic fail, epic waste of incredibly valuable real estate. You know, when you keep saying real estate, it's making me think, of a, like a Google search ad, it's almost like you're talking about search ads in yes. these emails. Cause I guess think about it. They're kind of formatted the same way. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And Google sells, you know, within their Gmail, they sell you ads like that too. Yeah. All right. So mobile versus desktop, any big difference in email practices there? Yeah. I mean, you basically have to cater everything towards mobile. Um, about 70% of all primary opens, a primary open is the first time you open up an email. 70% of all primary email opens will happen on a mobile device. So when you are testing your emails, or you're going to be sending them out. They need to be mobile friendly and you should be looking at your test messages on your mobile device and not your desktop necessarily because yeah. the majority of people will be looking at them on their phones. Uh, so to do that in reverse is really not, doing the right thing would you suggest you look at it on an android phone and an apple phone does it often matter uh it matters a little bit i mean if you're a sophisticated email marketer there are tools out there um that you know there's there's something called litmus.com there's email on acid there's a bunch of different tools out there where you can before you send it out you can render your creative your email in every known platform <laughs> To tell you yeah, the truth, wow. it, you could chase your tail because honestly, it's as long as it looks good, like on an iPhone or whatever, you should be fine. If yeah, not, you're going to spend your entire life trying to make it perfect for everything. And who cares if it doesn't show up on an Amazon Fire tablet perfectly? <laughs> That's probably the one I care the least about. That's hilarious. Right. <laughs> All right. So what about text versus HTML? Obviously, a text email is more likely to look fine than if we start making a really beautiful HTML email. But what is the pros and cons? Yeah, I mean, uh, you never really want to send out just a pure text email uh, because that'll actually be picked up as something that may in fact be spam uh, because the systems are looking for things that are out of the norm and pure text emails, just pure text yeah. would be considered out of the norm. When I say yeah. pure text, that means it doesn't even have a, a, a logo, an image of any kind, right? So I would avoid pure text uh, and most systems don't even require a text backup anymore a multi-part sending message you really shouldn't even need a text only version so um on the flip side of that you also don't want to have uh just an html version just a graphic one because a lot of people still view their email with images disabled not a ton but a decent amount and if you don't have kind of a hybrid email image heavy with text and 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 linkable text 
conduits, that's, that's really the best format that you're looking for. Oh, that's good advice. So what about these animated gifts? I'm seeing that happen more, even in yeah. signatures, I'm seeing that. Yeah, you will you see it more and more and more. Animated gifts do really well. They generate uh, a tremendous uh, click through. Uh, I also think that for medical practices that are visual with, or, you know, orthodontics certainly is where you can have, you know, if it was my practice and I can have a animated gift showing, you know, somebody's mouth before and then two, two turns later, they have a nice new smile. Oh my goodness. Come to us. We can do this. Uh, that's a win. And it does not impact email deliverability. It does not impact any of that animated gifts are three or four images that are tied together. That's what an animated GIF is. It is not a video. You don't want to send out a video and an email. It's too big of a file, It'll cause you uh, sending problems. But tying together three images, which is all an animated GIF is, and you can express uh, what it is that you do uh, rapidly and the outcome that you can achieve, it's a home run. It's a win from a click-through perspective all day long. So... That's, I'm glad that I asked that because I'm seeing it more and I'm wondering if that's the fad. It certainly sounds like it is. Oh yeah. And it's not going to go away. Um, you know, your inbox is getting more and more capable. Uh, if you fast forward two or three years from now, what you're going to be seeing in your inbox, like, and, and, and these medical offices, you're going to be able to book your appointment within the email. Uh, the emails are going to function very similar to simple websites. So you're not oh, going to actually fascinating. have, yeah, you're not going to need to click through and go to the website. You're oh, going to you really stay email. in the email. You will stay in the email. You'll do your thing and away you go. And that's it. Uh, huh. And the reason we're not there yet, we can do it functionality wise. We can do it. There is, there's always been an issue in terms of when you hit submit within an email, you actually submit data of any kind. Yeah. There is a more difficult passage uh, of data from a security aspect from that email message back to uh, the sender. But that's, that's being overcome as we speak. And so if you fast forward a few years from now, that's why email is going to become even more important than it is today. It's going to be, almost become your website. That'll be really fun, at least for us as marketers. That'll Absolutely. Open up a whole <laughs> arena of things we can do. All right. Absolutely. So if you're sending the, the from, should it be like a team, info, your name? What is the best practice there? Uh, you know, really depends on what you're capable of handling back. You know, if it comes from a person, then expect for that email to get replies, right? If it comes from a name, if it comes from something more generic, then you're going to limit the actual people replying back. So it really is a matter of what are you trying to achieve? If you're just trying to get out some content and you want people to go to your site, great, leave it generic. You know, it could be anything. It could be hello at, it could be newsletter at, it could be whatever mm -hmm. at. If you're trying to generate that one-to-one -one communication, then it should be, you know, Stephanie ad or whatever. That's great. Um, but it, so it's really dictated by what it is that you're sending out. How often should you use more than one? I think like a digital marketer, I see they send me different email from different fronts once in a while. Yeah, they're, 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 they're particularly uh, aggressive with uh, how they <laughs> change it up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think sometimes people change it up a lot to unfortunately trick you, right? Yes. Like, do I know that person? Wait a mm -hmm. minute, you know? And then uh, that's why they keep changing it up. Not a huge fan of that. If you have somebody in your office, let's say you have an office manager or a front office, front desk person that has a particular rapport, you know, with a lot of the people that are coming in and out, that's great. You know, they're almost like a, uh, a mini celebrity within your, you know, your universe, if you will. I have a great few clients with that, that situation. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. It's great to leverage that, you know, that connection. But then again, to manage, make sure that person knows there's an email coming out from them. That's number one. Uh, we've seen that show. And that can <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Then not say anything. <laughs> right. Terrible. And all of a sudden, your inbox is like, what the? <laughs> Sarah. What? Yeah, exactly. Right. So giving everyone the heads up. Um, but would you then have a, like a billing at if you're sending something like that? Because you wouldn't have it come from. The yeah, customer. absolutely. A hundred percent. You know, the more that you can, you know, share what this is all about. Great. Everyone's got a clue. Um, so, yeah, it's having more is not a bad thing. Um, it brings up something I've noticed that there's uh, there's more orthodontic practice than I believe should be using like Gmail accounts as their send because they haven't yeah, set up a professional. Is that that's that's a total no-no right am i that, correct that, that's there a, that's a fail you know yeah. it's like 
it, it, you know, it's like you meet someone. I don't want to be rude, but you meet somebody and they go, here's my email address. And it's uh, John Smith at AOL.com. You, you're, you're judging that person. I mean, you oh, judge that person when they tell you they have an AOL account, even though you shouldn't. In, in your head, instantly, you're like, oh, they're a little bit old school with technology. That's the first thing that comes into your mind, right? And same thing is if you're sending out emails from a medical practice from a singular, like a, like a Gmail or more of a consumer-based sending uh, environment, what you're saying to that person, whether you realize it or not, is, hey, we're small time. We're not sophisticated. We don't have advanced things going on over here. And that may also tie into the type of equipment that we use or our knowledge base or our, our level of expertise. I mean, it's not like the person instantly is thinking that, but the subconscious is there. I, believe built I mean, I know that's what I'm thinking, but I, you know, it's hard. Sometimes you got to cut it out of your head, yeah. but I think you're right. Yeah. Um, so is email, is it more like top of mind awareness or more engagement like click throughs? Is it both evenly? Like what is the tool really being used for, for the most part? You know, it's a multi-purpose tool. Um, it's being used for uh, important transactional things, confirmations and transactional things, which are more like receipts of information, right? And in, that, in those scenarios, you're not clicking through necessarily, but you're certainly opening, and that's certainly important. Um, it's being used for generating that top of the funnel interest where that person is just exploring who they're going to use and, and whatnot. And in that scenario, that click-through is, is everything. Uh, and then it's, you know, it's the continuity with the, with the patients, you know, sharing with them information that is useful to them. And the most important thing you always have to think about when you're sending out to your patients is it doesn't always need to be about you. You're not always selling. You want to provide useful content, you know, that over time will we'll look at, they will look at you and say, oh, they're valuable to me because they share things with me that better my family's life and my life. So you know, there's lots of different hats you wear when you send out email, uh, depending on what it is that you're sending out at that moment. Absolutely. So <clears throat> is there any, is there ever a reason when you should, or I said maybe not should, where it's okay to buy a list of email addresses and what are the dangers of doing something like that? You know, it's an interesting topic. If you ask, I'd say a hundred people that do what I do for a living, I would say 95% of them would say never buy a list. Okay. That's yeah. what they would say. I don't live in that camp because that's not actually, in my opinion, the real world. The funny part is the real world is people, the same people tell you, you never buy a list. They'll go out and they'll buy a list because it's very, very hard to grow your database organically. I work with some of the largest markers on the planet, fortune 100 companies. I would tell you about 80% of them buy lists believe it or oh not. wow that is fascinating yeah, yeah it's okay. crazy they buy lists now um they buy lists that hopefully have been curated in a, in a very sophisticated way yeah what i would tell you i'm not going to tell you yes you should or no you shouldn't what i will tell you though is um if you buy a list obviously try to make sure you're buying it from a reputable source but before you ever use a list that you buy um, you need to use a hygiene service. A hygiene service, and I'll give you some ideas of some names that are out there. A hygiene yeah. service is a service that you take the data that you bought, you give them the data you bought, they put it through their systems, and they will eliminate um, what are called blacklist addresses. They'll eliminate zombie addresses. They'll eliminate habitual complainers. They'll eliminate, you know, law practices that are going after all sorts of crazy, you know, ambulance chaser type stuff. Believe it or not, they have these hygiene abilities to eliminate the vast majority of stuff that you never want to send to. Yeah. And if you don't run it through a tool like that, invariably about 15% of the database that you buy is going to be really bad stuff. So a great example of a company like that would be Webula, W-E-B-B-U-L-A. Great yeah. company in terms of data hygiene. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there uh, similar to Webula. You just look up email data hygiene, and that's what I would recommend if you're going to consider buying a list. Okay. So what do you think the number one thing an office should do that would make a difference in email communication? Um, the number one thing I, I would say is get it organized and um, get it automated. Um, you're not, if you focus on email today, your office and you are, okay, we send out a newsletter once a week and then we're going to 
do this every time a patient comes, you're probably going to do that for two or three weeks. And then you're going to move on to the next urgent thing. Mm -hmm. If you can either through an agency or through yourselves, automate things, automate. Okay. As soon as it comes in within an hour, they get an email because we have this automated and they get this message. And then a week later they get this newsletter and this one gets this. If you can automate it, you will do very, very well for yourself. Do not overestimate the time that you will have to work on email marketing. You will not have the time. So set up those automations to buy you that time. And, and I believe, you know, that's how you'll win. Yeah, good advice. So is there anything that we missed you'd like to mention? Uh, no, it's fun. You know, I uh, spent a lot of money at the orthodontist on my kids and it came out pretty well. So uh, awesome. way to go, Dr. Moxa. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there anything on the horizon you want to talk about promote uh no listen we have a conference coming up in november yeah. um it's called guru conference you can go to guruconference.com it is a 100 percent free conference on email marketing it's going to be the largest virtual email marketing conference ever in the world we're going to have two days of amazing speakers. And again, it's totally free. But our spots are going to run out because our platform only holds so many people. So if you're interested in email marketing of any kind, guruconference.com uh, should be a lot of fun. Absolutely. We'll absolutely be there. So um, if someone wants to learn more about you, where should they go? Uh, they can go to my company's website, with it, which is uh, worlddata.com, W-O-R-L-D-A-T-A.com. So it's one D and one word. Visit subjectline.com. It's a free site for email marketing. That's a lot of fun. And uh, hit me up on LinkedIn and let's connect and uh, stay in contact. Awesome. Jay, thanks for being on the show. I always learn a lot when I hear you speak and uh, today is no exception. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. You got it. Okay. Take it easy. All right. You know, we take email marketing for granted, but it's such a ridiculously powerful tool. And once more, it's basically free. Jay gave you some great ideas on how we can really make it give us that ROI and help us get more patients into the practice. If you want to reach out to me personally, you can at Richard at OrthoSalesEngine.com. If you have an idea for a guest, just go to OrthoThrive.com. Keep grinding, keep thriving, and I'll see you next time.